I am so delighted to join with each of these women. Uh, Roberta is one of the Carter women appointees that I helped get appointed. And I'm so proud of her and everyone else because we work so hard on military expansion of issues for women. Uh, there are just so many things that the themes of these women's lives reverberate in what we've been able to do. Pamela Roberts is such an important person. Uh, she called me to tell me about this award. It was an exciting day. I called everybody else I knew. Um, <laughs> second, she sent me a letter saying that she was running for at-large uh, at House of Delegate. Uh, you'll all have a chance to vote. Don't forget that. <laughs> And third, she told me we're going to have you out of here at 1.45. So I'm going to be true to that and talk faster than a Texan normally would. I, have, I am so uh, pleased to have many of my family and friends of the heart here who share tables 18, 20, and 22. I can't but stand up, y'all. I am so pleased to have all of them here and my friends from the IRR committee. I know have a table, I just have no idea where it is. And I was thinking about people who are here who were in the videos of various people. Um, for example, I know that Chief Justice Judith Kay is here. She was mentioned earlier. I know she's somewhere in the audience <laughs> of New York. Uh, Liz Holtzman was in the picture of the signing of the extension of the ERA, and I know she's here, although I know not where. Um, one of the pictures there was of the women who helped me get elected. One of them was Ann Richards. Uh, she was the one on the far left. Her daughter, who stands in her own merit, is Cecile Richards, who is now who campaigned for me when she was 13 and who now is president of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. <laughs> Cecile, where are you? I think about the people who are the Girl Scouts and who led us all. They are still seated with us, those who could stay. And it reminded me of the words of Bob Hope, uh, excuse me, of George Burns. You know, George Burns died when he was 100. But when he was 96, he said, I can do anything today I did when I was 18. And then he said, it just goes to show how pathetic I was when I was 18. <laughs> And I look back at when I was 18. I grew up in a world where I played high school basketball. We were allowed two dribbles and to go to center court. After two dribbles, it was called traveling, a technical violation. And at center court, we had to throw the ball to our team members on the other end of the court. And I was one of those women saying, why can't we just keep running? <laughs> and they would say, oh no, all that jiggling and bounding and rebounding. <laughs> that would hurt your innards and then you wouldn't have a meal ticket. <laughs> well, I thought I could find some other. Or I think about that day when I went down and applied for a credit card. I had just graduated from law school and the man behind the desk explained that I would have to have my husband come sign it. And I explained to him that he was back from military service. I was going to try to put him through law school. But he didn't have any money. And the only money, well, little GI Bill. Uh, but the money was basically mine. And I thought my signature should be sufficient. And he told me he didn't care what I thought. Um, so I had to run for the legislature, pass the equal credit bill, and go back. <laughs> There are so many ways in which these young women who are less than 18 have a world to occupy that is so much different from the one I started out in. And one of the joys of my life has been trying to expand the options for women, to push back barriers, 
to rebel when people said women don't, women can't, women shouldn't. I was so proud when I won Roe versus Wade, but not just for me. It was because we had pushed back barriers and given women a much wider world to occupy. You saw the telegram from the Supreme Court in the video. I don't know if you noticed it, but the telegram was collect. <laughs> I can't remember what I paid for it, but I'd do it again. <laughs> or if you looked at that picture of the U.S. Supreme Court, you all know that when you argue there, there is a handmade goose quill pen at your place, and it's for you to take as a souvenir for having argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. So if you come to my office today, I have the handmade goose quill pen. And then I have that picture of the U.S. Supreme Court. You couldn't quite tell, but I have the signatures of each of the judges. Because if you send in and buy, get your hand, a buy a color photograph of the judges, they will sign it. Um, and so people come and they look at that picture and they say to me, well, can you get one of those if you lose? And I say, I don't know. I've never lost in the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> I think about the women we have appointed under Carter's leadership to the Supreme Court. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of whom I am so proud to have had a role in her getting the DC Circuit position. And I think of some people who did not get appointed. I want to tell you a very quick story. Like many of the women who share the podium, I graduated from law school in 1967, had very good grades. but. I finally got an interview with a Dallas law firm. The head of the firm spent the day with my interview because they had never interviewed a woman before and that was really uh, quite a difficult moment for them. <laughs> and they were saying things to me like, lawyers have to be home, I mean lawyers have to work late, women have to be home to cook dinner, how could you do both? Or things like to really train a young lawyer we have to be able to cuss them out. We can't cuss you, you're a woman. And other objectionable, uh, objections of that level. I did not get a job. It's partly why I could volunteer to do Roe versus Wade. Uh, but 13 years later, the senior partner wanted to be a federal judge. <laughs> there were three people who had to sign off. I was one of them. <laughs> and you know, I wouldn't have blocked him just because of that, but I went back and checked. The firm had not changed its practice very much, its uh, hiring policies very much. And then he made a really fatal error. He did not call me and say, I, ho I hear you're holding up my nomination. Could I come visit? He had a friend of mine, a Texas lawyer, call me and say, you have to appoint this man. That was the moment at which I went down to President uh, Carter and said, if you tell me I have to, I will approve this person, but otherwise I'm not going to. And he said, it's up to you. That's someone who never got to be a federal judge. <laughs> Time Magazine called me in 03 and said, we're gonna do a special issue of Time Magazine on 80 days that changed the world. It is, it is our 80th anniversary. And they said, would you write the piece for 1973? And of course, I was delighted to do it. You know how you work so hard on something, you have it perfect, and then you get a call that says you have to cut it in half because we think the war is gonna start. We've gotta cut the pieces. Then they call back and said, the war is gonna start. You must cut it even more, and at that point, you know, you just want to throw it in the trash. But I couldn't. I had to write my piece. So I was on an airplane. I had on my button. You all have seen them with the coat hanger in the middle, slash across it, circle around it. 
And the flight attendant kept coming by and she would look at that button and go on around. And she would come back and she would look at that button and she would go around and come back. And finally she stopped and she said, what do you have against coat hangers? <laughs> There are many ways in which we all are historic, partially because we have indeed changed the world. There is no one person, while we hold up each of these people for their wonderful accomplishments and characteristics, there is no one person that changes the world. It is a combined effort, an effort by every one of you men and women who are friends of the principle of equality who sit in this place. It is those of you who have spent part of your personal time and effort to move an issue ahead, an issue that deserves justice. I am proud to be here to be part of this occasion. I thank you for your tribute to principles that we have long worked for that no woman should have to stop at half court, and in the Olympics they're not, that no woman should have to stop before her own talent and will. Uh, she should be able to go as far as she can. And so I thank you. I thank particularly the daughters of many of you whom I've met today. And I thank these Girl Scouts for leading us today and for the world I hope you will be able to be in, which will be far wider, as wide as the Texas sky, and as high as you want to go. Thank you. <laughs>